Praise God. There's a video clip that I'm going to start. I'm going to start my sermon right now. So I'm going to show this video clip to bring us in to what I'm going to minister on. And our theme is keep America beautiful. How many of you know we have a responsibility to keep America beautiful? If the world doesn't care and the sinners don't care, when I'm talking about beautiful, I'm not talking about the grass, which is pretty, and the mountains, which is pretty. But let's keep, let's keep this America pure. Let's keep America lined up with the word of God. Can I hear an amen? amen. How many of you know we, every Christian has a responsibility to do that? Hallelujah. Let's show this video quick. This is still the best country in the world. This is still the only country that there isn't a waiting list to get out of it. How many of you know many of the other countries are waiting list to get out? They can't get out, but there's a waiting list. They're in line to get out. But we're the only country that doesn't have a waiting list to get out. There's a waiting list to come in. The number of people who say they've had a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ has increased by 10% in the past decade. We still are living in a time. I appreciate what Tian said, that whoever says this isn't a Christian nation, they're still missing 
the things that we was founded on. We are a Christian nation. 2.18 billion Christians around the world. Anybody hear me? 75% of Americans call themselves Christians. It's not me to judge whether they are or not. I know somebody just said in their spirit, oh, yeah, that's calling themselves. But we need to recognize that we still are living in the time when the word of God is being preached around this nation. Where power of God is touching people's lives. Praise God. Th something's going to happen spiritually in this nation. There is going to be an, a, a revival that's been started and it's going to break out. Do you know revival is, is breaking out in China as we speak? The Chinese people are giving their hearts to the Lord by the droves, and the, and the country doesn't know what to do about it. I'm believing that we'll see a change take place in this nation. Is somebody with me? Because in Romans chapter 5 and verse 20, it says, Moreover, the law entered that the offenses might abound, but where sin abounds, much more does God's grace abound. And we can look at the sin, we can look at the problems, we can look at the circumstances, we can look at what's happening around us. But I've got good news for you, church. Please don't lose heart. Please don't pull back and go into your cave and say, well, I'll let the world pass by. Please don't throw your hands up and say, there's nothing I can do. Please don't give up on this country and on this nation because God still has everything under control. And I believe that this revival will have an everlasting effect in America if we just have the tenacity to stand and to believe God and to pray. We must create the environment that welcomes the principles of Jesus Christ into our sphere of influence. We must create the environment. The environment is not going to be created by the world and the unbelievers and the agnostics and the atheists. Somebody with me. The environment is not going to be created by false religions and the occult. The environment for godliness is going to be created by God's people. I said uh, the environment for victory and for power and for the anointing is going to be created. And I believe that America is still beautiful. I believe that America still stands on the principles of God's word. I believe there's enough Americans, if 75% of the Americans claim to be Christians, even if that was that percentage was not actually correct as far as really true born-again believers is concerned, there's enough power to change the world. Yeah. Biblical principles that must be created to change our thinking and to bring reform into our nation. We must think biblical. We must think godly. We must think God's anointing and God's presence. We must think that he's the God of more than enough and still on the throne. We must think that the Holy Ghost is still the operating power that operates and moves and hovers and broods over the believer. You see, I believe that this nation, this nation is still the nation that will make the difference in the world. We still make more Bibles and Christian literature and send it around the world than any other nation. Are you with me? We still send out more missionaries to touch the world uh, than any other nation. <clears throat> we still believe that prayer is the answer and God still hears us when we pray. There's a few things I would like to share with you. Biblical principles that will create the atmosphere, that will create the anointing that we can say on down the road. When our grandchildren are being, <clears throat> are taking over the responsibilities of the country. Uh, when the next generation that stands up here and, and was singing a few minutes ago have the opportunity to move into their position of anointing and power and God's presence. I believe that some of these principles will make the difference and I'm going to share a few with, with you. Can I do that? For the next few moments we're going to have the Lord's Supper. And as we, as we receive these principles in our heart, remember this, that when we gather around this table and we have communion and we recognize the covenant that was made between man and God, 
Even though many men forgot about the covenant, God hasn't forgotten. I said, God hasn't forgotten. He's a covenant-keeping God. God knows the promises that he's made to the believer. God knows what he meant in Isaiah 43 when he said he knows us and he calls us by name. And when we go through the rivers, it will not overtake us. When we go through the waters, it will not <clears throat> destroy us. When we go through the fire, we will not be burned. Because God, God has still got his hand on this nation. God still has his hand on the believers. God still recognize that you got up this morning and you could have went somewhere. You could have went out uh, to the golf course. You could have went out to the lake to fish. You could have went to Disney World. But you came today to the house of God because you know that God has his hand upon your life and he's moving in your life and you trust him with it. Give yourself a big hand clap. <clears throat> First principle I'd like to look at for the next few moments is the principle to be bold. Simple, be bold, be bold, be strong. The Lord thy God is with thee. Be bold in your, in your commitment. Be bold in your convictions. I heard someone say this morning that many of the churches are buying in to some of the ungodly <clears throat> things that they're told they have to buy into. And they're bending and bowing against their very own convictions and the very things that they know that's right uh, to uh, catal to the, uh, to the system that we live in. Churches are bending and bowing. I like what those three Hebrew children said. Whenever they was told by King Nebuchadnezzar, bow down to our king. And they said, oh king, we're not going to bow. They said, King, we're not going to bow to the principles of ungodliness. We're not going to bow to an idol. We're not going to bow to the principles of, of the heathen. But we will stand upon the word of God because our God will deliver us. But they, they didn't get done yet. They weren't finished yet. Now they said, but if he don't, <clears throat> but if God has another plan, but if God wants to work in another vein, but if God wants to move another way, King, get this straight. Understand it. Without any equivocation, without any doubt, get a hold of this. We're not bowing. You see, they knew who they believed and they knew who God was in their life and they knew that he was bigger than any problem in any circumstance and they knew at the end God was going to show up and God was going to bring them through and God somehow, some way was going to bring them through. He said, if, O oh, King, we're not going to bow because our God will deliver us, but if he don't, we still not bowing. See, you got to have that kind of conviction and be bold and be bold. Can I hear an amen? <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 8, you can turn there with me. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 11. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 11 says, For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand. And instructed me that I should not walk in the way of the peop of this people, saying. Verse 12. Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy. Nor be afraid of the threats, nor the troubled, nor be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be the one that you fear. Let him be the one that you dread. You see, church, there's so much fear going on in our land today. There's so many things people are worried about and fearful about and whether we're going to be able to do this and whether we're going to be able to do that and whether uh, we uh, still have freedom to do this and the other thing. These are conspiracy attacks from the enemy himself. We can't have a conspiracy mentality. We can't live our life walking around looking over our shoulder. Is somebody going to try to hurt me? We can't be afraid to get up and go to church or go out and speak, how, uh, speak what's on our heart or be able to even conduct ourselves with the joy of the Lord if we're worried about somebody that's going to do harm to us. That's a conspiracy mentality. If we fear a conspiracy, if we fear a conspiracy, you start backing down and backing up. You start looking around and looking over your shoulder. You start thinking the adversary is out to get you at any time. 
We have become a conspiracy-minded people. And the reason why, there is some conspiracies of the New World Order. There's conspiracies in the New Age teaching. There's conspiracy in one world, uh, in, in a one world uh, economic system. Uh, there's conspiracy in ISIS. And we can let these things stop us, but I've got news for you. The Word tells me not to get caught up in the conspiracy of people uh, but let the Lord of hosts be the one that will hallow, that will uh, we'll praise and will give glory to. Uh, let him be the one uh, that we fear. If we recognize the fear of the Lord is in my life, I don't have to fear anything else. Because I got my confidence in him. You see, we need to understand. We need to say the fear of the Lord. In the fear that when I have the uh, when I have the fear or the respect or the honor for the Lord, I know who He is in my life, and I know He's He's got me in His hand, and I know that all things are wrapped up in Him. I don't have to worry about the conspiracies of this world. You see, the one world movement does not have to put fear in me. I recognize that my God is a God of more than enough. If a person doesn't change the way he thinks. He'll never change the way he acts. You see, we need to change the way we think. Now, don't get caught up in the thinking of the world. Don't get caught up in the, in, in, in the latest things that we know that the world has allowed uh, to happen. Now, don't be fearful uh, that we can't be free. We just saying, I'm free, I'm free. Praise God, uh, God Almighty, I'm free. I'm free in the things of God, and he'll keep us free because he's a God of more than enough. This nation is still a beautiful nation. The second thing I want you to look at for a few moments as we look at the beauty of this nation, if we're going to walk in the anointing and the presence of God, we're going to have to think positive. Don't be pulled down by all the negative. Think positive. Know who you are. I know who I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep me until that day. I know that no weapon formed against me can prosper. I know that if God be for me, then who can be against me? Proverbs 23 and 7. You turn there with me. Proverbs 23 and 7. For he that thinks in his heart, so is he. For as a man thinks in his heart, for how a man thinks about himself in his heart. For how a man puts confidence in his relationship with God in his heart. So is he. And there's a lot of folks who are getting, getting influenced by the thinking of the system. And thinking of circumstances. And thinking of the evil things. And thinking of the ungodly things. But for a man thinks in his heart. So is he. He eats and he drinks. He says to you. But his heart is not with you. You see, we need to understand uh, that how a man thinks, how a man thinks. How many of us who want to see God in public affairs think there's not enough Christians uh, to turn it around? Uh, there's a few good Christians that love God, but they'll probably not be able to turn it around. Uh, there's a few good people that love God, but probably uh, they're not going to be able to override the onslaught <clears throat> of the ungodly. If we believe... If we believe like that, that's what's going to happen. But if we believe that God puts everybody in government according to his divine will, and at the right time, God will bring circumstances to change, and God will move by the anointing of God, and the Holy Spirit can still finger around the hearts of even those, like he did back in the day with Pharaoh. He can change a heart, and he can bring the anointing, and he can bring the positive if we think positive. If we believe, in 1970, the court said that 82% of the nation wanted prayer back into the schools. I said back in the 70s, 82% of the people wanted prayer back into the schools. Back in the, it was, in, it was 89% in 1990. 83% of one of the Ten Commandments back on the walls of our public buildings. 70% uh, wanted uh, the creation uh, of, of God uh, to be taught in our schools. 
82% of the people oppose homosexual rights. Yet we think there's not enough to make a difference. Here's the problem. If we don't stand and we don't pray and we don't speak up and we don't seek God, the disorganized majority will be overthrown by the organized minority. Is anybody with me? You see, how we think. We can't run fearful. We can't say I'm not going to do anything. We can't say that there's nothing that I can do. If we just think right, it'll make the difference. If we just stand on the word of God, it'll make the difference. If we just believe that God has still got everything in his hand and God still has everything under control and this still is a godly nation and when it's all said and done, when God moves by his power and his might, hey, Pastor, don't you think he's going to bring some judgment? I really do. I believe there's going to be some judgment. But the scripture says if judgment begins in the house of the Lord, then where does the sinners and the ungodly stand? The duty to become involved is ours. The results of our involvement is the Lord's. That's the reason we're told to pray. That's the reason we're told to seek. That's the reason we're told to knock. That's the reason we're told not to back down and be afraid, but be bold and go forward and stand and believe God and think right, and it'll make the difference. The third thing, if this nation is going to continue to be a beautiful nation, if God is going to have the opportunity to reign like we know that he wants to reign, he's going to use Christians, he's going to use the body of Christ, he's going to use the believers, and I think we must take the offensive or the aggressive position. We got to be aggressive about how we feel. We got to be aggressive about what we say. We got to stand on the word of God. I didn't say arrogant, I said aggressive. I didn't say do, uh, do ungodly or, or, or things that put a bad reproach on the word of God or on the power of God. I'm saying be aggressive in the way we think and the way we act and what we believe. For the past several decades, the Christian community has had about nine major legal groups that was able to stand and make a difference. All have been on the defense. We need to say, wait a minute. Our time, our line is at hand. Our future for our children is at hand. We're going to stop backing up. We're going to start taking a, a, a positive position. We're going to draw a line in the sand like Joshua did. And he said, decide this day who you're going to believe. He said, if you're going to, if you, if you're going to believe the gods of Baal, then go believe the gods of Baal and worship Baal. If you're going to worship God, step across the line. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for this house, as for this house, Faith Outreach Center, the children of God in this house, the believers that are part of this house, the members of this church, the blood-bought believers, the redeemed, we're going to stand and we're going to say, as for this house, we will believe in the word of God and we will stand upon God's word and we will not compromise. Because we're going to keep America beautiful. We need to take the offensive position. Number four, if we're going to keep America beautiful, we need to make good with whatever God gives us. I said we need to make good with whatever God's put in your hand. We're all talented. We're all anointed for something. We're all gifted in some capacity. And some people are gifted to write. Some people are gifted to talk. Some people are gifted uh, to uh, make finances. Some people uh, are, are gifted to communicate in a tremendous way. We're all gifted. And it will realize the gifting is not from yourself. It's from God that's gifted you and anointed you. And Paul says, stir up the giftings as is within us. That the power of God might flow through us. Is somebody with me? God makes God, uh, make God with whatever God gives. Make good. Make good with whatever God gives you. Make it work. Make it effective. Exodus 23, if you look at that with me. Exodus 23 and 29.
God already told them what he was going to do, and he already told them how he was going to deliver them and set them free. And I will send hornets in 28. Exodus 23, 28. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivites and the Canaanites and the Hittites from before you. And I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land becomes desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. But here's how I'm going to do it, God said. Little by little. Somebody say little by little. Here, here a little, there a little. Here a little, there a little. Dot an I and cross a T. A little by little. Little by little. I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. Oh, it won't look good at first. It looks like I'm not doing anything, God said. It looks like I'm not moving in this, in this seemingly ungodly situation. It seems like when... The land is being overtaken uh, by the enemy and by the locust and by the beasts and by the hornets. He said, it looks like I'm not moving, but I'm moving. And as I start to move little by little, I'll bring change into your life. If I did it all at one time, uh, you would uh, misunderstand what I'm doing. But little by little, he said, I'm going to bring it to pass. Deut Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 22. And the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. And the Lord God will drive out those enemies before you. How's he going to drive them out? Little by little. You will be unable to destroy them at once, lest the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you and will inflict defeat until, until unto them until they are all destroyed. I don't know about you, but that gives me a lot of hope. I don't know about you, but that tells me God is still moving in my behalf. I don't know about you, but God don't have to do something all at one time to impress me. All I got to know, he's God. And he's bigger than any circumstances and bigger than any situation. He'll do it little by little. Why? So we don't take more than we uh, than we can handle. So there isn't more uh, opposition and, and more piled up on us than we can handle. God still has everything under control. This the nation is still a beautiful nation. It'll be a beautiful nation because God is on the throne. Is anybody with me? You see, God wants us to learn by the experiences. It was mentioned this morning, one of the preachers that I listened to in the morning, how when 9-11 came, can anybody remember 9-11? When the airplanes went in and the Twin Towers were, were dropped in New York. Shortly after 9-11, we was full. This church was packed out. All the churches were packed out. People were gathered in the house of God because something gripped them. And, and some of it was, uh, was uh, the lack of uh, realizing God was there, but they, uh, but they refocused. Other people were brokenhearted because loved ones uh, were destroyed in that horrible, horrible uh, terrorist act. Uh, some people came to church because they was reconnecting with God. And they knew how fragile life is and how quick something can happen. But then six months later, we went back to the same old ways. People went back to their activities on Sunday. People went back to enjoying life and enjoying all the pleasures, and they forgot so quickly how fragile life was. I believe that we need to learn from the experiences of that and say, I'll never forget. I'll never forget. That God is still on the throne and he's the God of more than enough. Use what we have. Do good with what God's put in you. Be good stewards over the finances. Be good stewards over the talents. Be good stewards over that what God's given you. We don't know what tomorrow holds. But I know who holds tomorrow. I said, but I know who holds tomorrow. Then God will give us more if, he can be, if we can be trusted with what he's already given us. In the last few times that we find out that there's those in Christian office, there are some right now that, are, uh, that, uh, that I believe uh, that would make a difference. 
I believe there's some people right now God has lined up to put in strategical places to turn things around, to bring this nation back into holiness and back into godliness. Can anybody say amen? amen. Does anybody believe that? Amen. One more thing I'd like to look at, and I'm going to close because we have communion. And that is we need to look at one of the, I call it one of the biggest words in the Bible. Here it is. We need to fulfill the ifs in the Bible. The ifs. Ifs make a difference. If my people. I said if my people. Are you with me? The biggest word in the, in the Bible to me is if. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Is anybody with me this morning? Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. Let us, not, let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap. We shall, here's the big word. We shall reap if. Anybody with me? We shall reap if we do not lose heart. Oh, listen. If you don't underline anything, underline that little if. If turns things around. If makes, it, if makes things different. If changes the whole, uh, the whole spectrum of what we're talking about. Let's not, uh, let, let's not lose heart doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. You see, I don't, want to, I don't want us to lose heart, church, because God is still moving mightily. John 15, the gospel according to John. The gospel according to John, chapter 15. We don't have time to look at this now, but if you read it later, you're going to find eight times in this one little time that Jesus talks about uh, the, uh, the abiding in the vine. Eight times he says if. Verse 10. Well, we can look at verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me and he does not abide, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and they throw them into the fire to be burned. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my word abides in you. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in, in my love just as I have kept, just as I, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. In verse 13, if you do whatever I command you. This little word if is a big word, amen? If, if we can get the mind of God. If we can get that long-term mentality and hang in there and don't give up and don't quit, it'll make the difference. It'll make the difference in our country. It'll make the difference with our children. It'll make the difference in our mentality. It'll make the difference whether you have joy or not because the joy of the Lord is our strength. And then one more. One more thing I think that's vitally important if we are going to recognize and maintain the beauty of this America. It's not, going to be, it's not going to be all the new philosophies that's coming down the pike. It's not going to be all the ungodly changes that are trying to be made in the midst of what we've always believed. It's not going to be moving the landmarks that we stood on for all of our life from our time of our childhood that our parents believed. It's going to be accepting responsibilities of who we are and run with the power and the anointing of God. Be steadfast and unmovable. Abound in the things of God. Jeremiah 31. Will someone look at that with me? Jeremiah 31, verse 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Oh, I love this statement. God solidifies who he is in case anybody doubts. God tells us that he's a God of more than enough. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything? Somebody ought to say no when I read this. Is there anything too hard for me? I said, is there anything too hard for Jehovah? Is there anything too hard for Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Nisi? Is there anything too hard for the God of more than enough? Is there anything too hard for El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one? 
Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into, into the hand of the Chaldeans and into the hands of, an, of Nebuchadnezzar. You see, we, we need to understand that God still is, is on the throne. God still has everything under control. God is still moving in the midst. Amen? That was Jeremiah 32, 20, 32, 27 that I just read, by the way. And then I want us to look at Jeremiah 31, 27. Behold, the day is come, and saith the Lord, that I will... That I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seeds of the men of the seeds of the beast. And it shall come to pass that I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down and to throw down and to destroy and to afflict. So I will watch over them and I will build up and I will plant because I'm the Lord of more than enough. Is there anything too hard for God? Is there anything too hard for God? Accept the responsibilities that we have. Accept the fact that God has called us to be steadfast. We can't say, well, it's just always been this way. You can't say, well, it's because of my culture. It's because of my background. It's because of my family tree. It's because of who I came from. And I just that's just how I am, Pastor. I can't change. Yet you can. We need not to live on the excuses of who we are, or who we, where we came from, or what our parents did, or what our background is. We need to say, I am a new creation. I'm a brand new man. Old things are passed away, and all things become new. I am a child of the Most High God, and I serve the God of more than enough. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 7. Second Chronicles 7 and 14. If my people, somebody say my people, not the heathen, not the world, not the ungodly. Don't expect the world and the God, ungodly people to all of a sudden get all excited over the mysteries of the kingdom that you already have revelation of. But if my people, there's that if again, if, if, my people. It might be, but what? Who are called by my name? Is anybody here called by the name of the Lord? Is anybody here redeemed, washed in the blood, going to take communion because you are already connected in covenant with God? Is there anybody you ought to wave your hand and shout and give a glory shout and say, I am the redeemed? Who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. Then I'll forgive their sin. Then I'll heal their land. Hallelujah. 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 Every promise in the book is mine. I believe God's word. I gave you enough word. I gave you enough word just this morning in a few minutes. That you just anchor your soul and you ought to say... No matter what, I am going to serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. If the whole world wants to go down the opposite way, I will not be moved. I shall not be. I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the rivers of living water, I will not be moved. Amen.